I've been presenting about crypto, as you might have heard from the introduction, for about seven years. And um, it's kind of interesting to watch how uh, things have evolved or, or haven't evolved in that time. Um, one thing that strikes me when, still today when I go um, watch um, Bitcoin talks or, or crypto talks is how people talk about crypto going mainstream as if it's in the future. I think that um, we've seen a lot of interest in terms of uh, investment or speculation in crypto, um, but we haven't seen a lot of talk about real world use cases. Um, and so today I'm not going to be talking about blockchain technology or how things might work on the back end, but I'm going to try to give you as concrete as possible a picture of um, what a real world use case of crypto might look like and one that, that we're actually very close to. And that use case is one that I'm very excited about, which is web monetization. Now, web monetization basically means you have a website, you have a web application, you have a blog, you have a you know, video, and how do you make money from that online? Um, and yeah, with, without further ado, I want to jump right into a presentation. There's a, a handy dandy button, and I'm just going to click that button, and uh, oh, oh no. All right, well, that's, you always got to watch out for these, uh, these fake buttons, but I'm just going to close this. Oh boy. Um, okay, this is not the website I wanted to go to. Um, there's a lot of ads on there, though. Um, let's see if we can just uh, scroll down. Oh, we ran out of memory. So this is kind of like what browsing the web is, is like these days. Um, you run into a lot of ads. You run into a lot of you know, things like fake buttons and scams and, and so on. And a lot of that is because even the websites that are trying to give you useful content, they still have to have a way to monetize. They still have to have a way to make money. Um, and so they rely on advertising. And in order to understand that problem or the scope of the problem, um, you really have to think about like how annoying this is for a user. Like you're just trying to read the news, you're just trying to get some content, and there's ads everywhere, and you can't get it. And so more and more people are actually uh, turning to ad blockers to try to solve the problem. Um, but of course, if you use an ad blocker, you create another problem, which is now the content creator isn't making any money because you know you're looking at the ads and. Advertisers aren't paying for nothing, they're paying for, for eyeballs. And so a lot of people that use ad blockers actually feel guilty about that um, because you know, you're taking away the way that the content creators whose content you're using and, and hopefully who you want to support, you know, they rely on that. And so how do we address that problem? Well, first, we got to understand the problem better. Um, and so in order to understand the problem, we have to go back to the beginning of advertising and think about where does advertising actually come from and why is it used on the web? And so what's relevant to this discussion is, um, is that ads are really used for broadcast media. right? So you basically um, you put out your radio show, you put out your TV show. And because anyone can listen to it, anyone can just tune in, it's very hard to make money off of that um, because you can't really charge people when they start listening to it. Like anyone can listen from anywhere. Um, and so ads have really evolved in, in uh, conjunction with broadcasting where um, you have to have a way to monetize the sort of open content that anyone can tune into. Um, and this model has sort of translated to the web, which is kind of weird because the web is not actually a broadcast medium. Um, so the web is actually a one-to-one -one interaction, right? So I'm going to the website, the web server is sending me the website, they're not sending it to anyone else. It's a one-to-one -one interaction just like you're going to the grocery store, going to the movie theater. Um, I'm getting the, the content um, after I have requested it. It's not out on the airwaves. It's not being broadcast. So why do we use advertising? Um, and if I uh, put it another way, you know, I'm making the request, and I'm getting back the content, but I also get some stuff that I don't want along with it. Um, and this is not really how it would be ideally. Uh, ideally, you would just send some money, and then you would get back the thing that you're trying to get, which is the content. Um, and this is kind of how it should be. And the creators of the web actually foresaw this issue, or they kind of envisioned that there would be, um, there would be a, a way to do this on the web, which is uh, they actually reserved an error code for O2, which essentially means that, hey, you were supposed to pay for this web page, you didn't pay, and so you're getting this error. And so this was something that 
you know, maybe there would have been some kind of payment protocol or something uh, that you could put it behind this. But even now, like 30 years later, there still isn't any protocol like that, or at least there wasn't until very recently. Um, so I want to introduce you to uh, such a protocol, which is called the Interledger Protocol. This is a project that started a couple of years ago, and it's basically the idea is that you want to abstract how money actually moves um, and just sort of talk about money movement in, in abstract terms. Um, and then you can build applications that don't necessarily tie into a specific payment method or a specific ledger or if you're talking about blockchain, a specific blockchain, but rather you could use anything in the back end, just like with the internet, you can use any kind of um, communication technology in the back end. People have even done internet protocol over carrier pigeons um, as a test. Um, and of course, that's not very good performance, it, you know, very, low late, very high latency and, and very low bandwidth, um, but it works. And so um, really interesting thing is that the internet abstracts how you can send information around. Now, Interledger, it's a community group at the W3C. Um, it's an open protocol. There are now about uh, 340 contributors, which makes it the third largest community group at W3C uh, behind uh, WebAssembly and progressive web apps. Um, and so this group has been going for a while. And so today, I want to talk a little bit about what we've achieved so far as, uh, within that group. So the entire architecture of Interledger is really based on the internet. And, and what we're trying to recreate is the sort of efficiency of the internet um, in terms of internet moves money, sorry, the internet moves information very cheaply. And so we want to build something that moves money very cheaply. And so I'm going to show you, since I don't have the ability to do a live demo, I'll show you some screenshots of what Interledger actually looks like um, as it's running. And so this is from a test where it was basically uh, paying for an API call. And so I'm basically making this API call, and then it is contacting the server, and then it is um, kind of getting a quote for how much it needs to pay, and then a whole bunch of stuff kicks off. Um, this is kind of the actual Interledger protocol in action. And what happens here is, is things like, um, you know, it's splitting the payment into smaller packets, it's routing the packets through the network, it's figuring out how to settle those packets, and so on. So it's doing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, and eventually, the payment completes, and then um, we're done with the payment. Um, but really, you don't need to understand any of that, and I don't have time to explain any of it. Um, all you need to know is that basically what Interledger does is it makes it so that you can send tiny amounts of money, and you basically don't have any fees, and you basically don't have any latency. It, it, it's instant. And so we have the underlying payments technology now that we could theoretically go back and fix the web protocols and kind of add this payment functionality to it. Um, but there's still one big question, which is, what would that actually look like? What would be the user experience of um, adding payments to the web? Because normally when you do payments online, it would look like something like this. You have your payment button, and you go through some kind of login flow, and then you authorize the payment, and then the payment goes through and then you've paid. Um, but that works if you're doing 2.1 payments a day, which is the average. Um, but it doesn't work if you're trying to do micropayments where you're paying for a lot of content, and you're literally, like for every YouTube video and so on, you're trying to make a payment. And maybe there might be, there could be even multiple payments per web page, right? There's a web page that's sort of taking content from a bunch of different sources and combining it, remixing it. Um, you don't want to have to like authorize payments for all these different things. And so we need to come up with a user experience that actually works at that scale. And so one suggestion or one idea would be to think about like how do you make payments without any user interaction? Um, and there's a lot of things that immediately come to mind, like how would that work? What if a website takes all my money? If I'm not controlling it, if I'm not authorizing the payment, how, how could that possibly work? But think about it this way, like your web browser is already managing scarce resources, right? So your, your browser is already managing there's a little bit of screen real estate that the website is taking up. Um, it might be like trying to figure out how much CPU to allocate, allocate to each website and how much memory to allocate to each website. And so really, we're just talking about yet another resource that your browser might be managing for you, which is money. Um, and one thing that really inspired me in this, in this regard was um, the 21 Bitcoin computer. Uh, does anyone remember the 21 Bitcoin computer? One person, <laughs> two people, all right. Um, so this was a little computer that came out, uh, I think a couple years ago, uh, and you could buy it and would sort of mine Bitcoin, and it would 
create this sort of device that you could tap into where just Bitcoins would sort of flow out of like a little tap. And what was really cool about that is that if your Bitcoin computer gets hacked, it's not like there's a big wallet that somebody can just steal and, and run away with. It's just a sort of tap. And so the only money they can steal is, is whatever money is being generated while they're logged into this computer. And so what makes it really nice is that it, it's a much lower risk kind of setup. And you can do the same thing without mining. You just have a, a tap of money because you know, you're know you paying for it monthly or something like that. And somebody's giving you this tap of money for a monthly retainer. Um, and now you can actually send this money out as you're browsing the web. And that's something that the browser can manage. This is something that you don't have a lot of risk as a user. You're just browsing the web, and you're getting this extra benefit from having uh, the incentive for, for websites and being able to reward website creators as well. Um, so the way you can kind of imagine it is you have these sort of streaming payments from you to the website as you're browsing the web, basically just going on in the background. And the way that it's actually implemented is um, we have a browser API called uh, window.monetize. So the website calls it API, and then the browser gives it um, what's pretty similar to a WebSocket, except it's a, a payment-enabled socket. And then the website can choose to connect to itself or whoever it needs to pay um, using that API. And so now it can you know, use paid endpoints on the web. And the way that you limit the amount that the website can spend is just based on time. So the longer you spend on the website, the, the more time you spend on the website, the more it can charge. Um, in the future, it could be more optimized. It could be more intelligent user agents. But this is a good place to start. Now, what does that mean for the website? What does that look like from the website's perspective? So let's say you're a streaming video website, right? So people come to your site, and they watch videos. It's a pretty obvious how you would integrate with uh, web monetization, which is you would set up a stream when the user clicks play, or maybe even when the page loads. And you would just sort of pay for the video stream as the user is streaming money to you. Um, there might be things like, depending on the money bandwidth that the user has, you might send a higher or lower resolution of the video. Um, but these are all kind of the details. But the general idea is like it lines up very well with streaming video. But you might say, OK, well, but what about if I have an article or something like that or a blog post? And I think that's a much, more, much trickier <laughs> use case. But I think you can still do something kind of streaming where you know, as you're scrolling and you're reading the article, like more and more of the article loads as you stream more and more money. I don't know if, if that's what people will do, but that's one idea of how you can map this different use case onto streaming payments. But what if you have like an interactive app, you know, like a to-do list app or something like that? Well, once again, you know, as the user's logged in, you could just monetize the usage. So every time I open the app, I'm paying a little bit to the creator. And again, for me, you know, it doesn't matter because I'm paying monthly anyway um, for my entire flat rate for web monetization. And so I'm not actually spending any more for using this app, but I'm getting maybe some benefit. Maybe the app has fewer ads. Maybe I didn't have to subscribe to it. Maybe I didn't have to do anything special to, to get a sort of a, a slightly premium experience. And a lot of people are kind of asking, like, OK, well, um, I already have a subscription model. You know, I don't really want to um, cannibalize that. I don't want to give people an out where they don't have to subscribe to my service. Um, these are the kind of, kind of problems you run into. A lot of users say, like, hey, I like free content. Why, do, why would I want to pay if I can get things for free? Um, and so I don't think that either the free or the premium model are going away. I think there's still sort of room for both. There's going to be websites that do both. I would think of this as another model that kind of lives in between um, free and premium. So this is something that you might do um, that gives users a little bit more features than if they were just a free user that was ad-supported, um, but maybe not as many features as if they were a premium user. And there might also be websites that do two or even just one of these. Um, so for example, you might have a website that really focuses on web monetization and doesn't support uh, any of the other monetization methods. Now, where are we in this project? So right now, there is a, a working prototype. Um, it's been a couple years since the original IntelliJ white paper came out. Um, and so we've been playing around with this technology. Um, a lot of the, the, the specs really only got finalized late last year, um, as well as uh, a couple months ago. Um, I'll quickly explain what stream is. Stream is essentially like the TCP equivalent. So if you're familiar with TCP IP, TCP, what it does is it takes your data and kind of splits it up and uh, sends any, resends any chunks that got lost and things like that. And if you're doing 
what we call penny switching, which is basically sending packets of money around, you need to do something very similar. You need to um, you know, split your bigger payments into smaller chunks, you need to resend chunks that get lost, and, and you gotta manage the connection, and you also gotta decide how fast you wanna send the money. If you send it too fast, you might, the network might run out of liquidity, um, you might, uh, the packets might not get there, and then you wanna back off, just like TCP does. So um, this is all implemented in the stream protocol, and so what we want to do next is we want to create an actual um, flat rate, a consumer product, something that users can sign up for, um, maybe install it as a browser extension, um, and then start surfing the web and kind of monetize uh, websites or support websites that way. Um, and that's why I'm leaving Ripple, is I'm starting a new company called Coil, uh, which will make just that product. And then eventually we want to have a final web monetization spec and then hopefully start to deploy that in other browsers as well. So just to kind of recap, um, we think web monetization is an interesting new way for websites to monetize. It's a different way for, for webmasters to make money. Um, I think it's a very interesting thing to come out of the whole blockchain space. You kind of take payments, you make them more and more efficient, and now suddenly you can do things that weren't possible before. Um, I also think that it's gonna require websites to kind of rethink their business model. It's gonna require them to rethink their user experience. Um, and I think it's gonna be very interesting to see what people do with that. Um, so if you're interested in any of this stuff, please check out these links. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So unfortunately, because of our slightly late start, I don't think we're going to be able to do questions on this session. But you're going to be around a little bit today, I hope? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to head out to the airport a little bit, but I'll be around for a couple okay. minutes. Very cool.